in discussing a matter which, which combines, obviously, economic and financial theory on the one hand with public impact on the other. Um, I, th the euro is, is a topic which elicits completely co contrary reactions. Um, I looked up a long list of, uh, of remarks about the euro at the time of its launch, and they, are, they go beyond praise to almost poetry. On the other hand, um, a critic as level-headed as Robert Samuelson, a Washington Post columnist, said the launch of the euro was the greatest public policy disaster since the Second World War. So obviously there is a wide uh, range of contentious opinions on this issue. Now, as our um, uh, commentator, we are fortunate in having Tamas Halm. He's the editor-in-chief of the monthly economic journal of the Academy of Science. He's on the board of the Academy. He's a former uh, Secretary General of it, um, but of course, in addition to his academic uh, distinction, he has been um, an Under Secretary of State uh, in the De National Development Office, and he was particularly responsible for channeling EU support to Hungary. So he speaks with uh, great authority. Um, on uh, as our uh, as our speaker and lecturer, um, we have Antonio Martino. Now, uh, again, I'm not going to list the academic distinctions of yes. Professor Martino. <laughs> I will say simply that he was a, a, a pupil and remained a close friend of Milton Friedman, the, uh, one of the most distinguished economists of the last century. Um, and in addition to his academic work, he, has been, he, was, he served in several Italian governments. To the, uh, he, did, he was never given control of the treasury to the eternal regret of the Italian taxpayer, but he was um, both foreign minister and defense minister, and he was, occupied those positions at times of, ex, of great international crisis and, and, and performed with distinction. So uh, having, um, having a de detailed uh, the reasons why you should pay close attention uh, to um, the two, uh, our two speakers, all I need now do is to welcome you again and then turn to Professor Martino and ask, us, ask him to address us. Thank you very much, John, for your kind words. And thank you all for being here uh, in this beautiful uh, Budapest spring afternoon. You have a high opportunity cost coming here to listen to me. Uh, the father godfather or stepfather of the euro is thought by many observers to be Robert Mandel, winner of the Nobel Prize for Economic Sciences, and one of the inventors of the concept of optimum currency area, OCA. In the spring of 1967, many years ago, I sat in Bob's cl class uh, on capital theory at the University of Chicago, and we are friends. On the issue of OCAs, however, I do not agree with Bob's views. An area to qualify as OCA must have perfect factor mobility within. This means labor and capital must move freely without natural or man-made obstacles. Not many nations meet that criterion. In fact, I doubt anyone does. Prudently, Bob does not refer to nations. He talks instead of regions. Can the nations of the Eurozone qualify to be an OCA? I don't think so. Bob does. Mandel has defined the euro dollar rate as the most important price in the world. However, he's also convinced that that rate should be kept fixed. I disagree. Something can be considered a price and perform the functions of a price only if it can change, moving up or down as market conditions dictate. When there is a potential dollar shortage, the increase of its price in euros encourages some people to sell more dollars, and it discourages others from asking. Anyone can buy dollars only as long as someone else is prepared to sell, to sell them at a mutually beneficial exchange rate. Under freely floating exchange rates, deficits and surpluses are simply impossible. This was Milton Friedman's view. I agree with him, but not so Robert Mandel. For our discussion, however, the issue of whether the euro dollar exchange rate should be fixed or flexible is not terribly important. So let's go back to the euro and the eurozone. 
the arguments for a European currency, the argument for a European currency is based on three advantages it would have over national monies. The first is that countries using the same currency enjoy a much higher level of trade than they otherwise would. This is probably true, but in the case of Canada and the United States, the use of two separate currencies does not seem to hinder trade much. The second advantage is that countries using the same currency need not worry about balance of payments problems among themselves. In fact, no nation I know of keeps record of regional balances of payments. Milton Friedman was convinced that balance of payments problems require the existence of a central bank and fixed exchange rates. If either one goes, the problem disappears. The third advantage of a common currency is that it makes debt monetization on the part of national governments impossible. This should prevent monetary instability. The monetary financing of budget deficits has almost always been the cause of the great inflations of the 20th century. Unable to borrow enough to finance their spending, governments would sell their debt to the central bank, thus creating money at a rate that sooner or later resulted in price inflation. The creators of the euro were well aware of the importance of the currency's stability and correctly included a clause in the Stability and Growth Pact that did not allow debt monetization by the European Central Bank. The ECB was not allowed to purchase national government's bonds because this money creation would weaken the euro. We all know the destiny of this prohibition at a time when Mr. Draghi is generally praised for his policy of quantitative easing, QE. The European Central Bank is presently engaged in massive national debt monetization in the attempt to contrast the deflationary and recessionary tendencies of our time. I doubt that QE will succeed in its intent. Monetary policy decisions do not produce their effects immediately. They do so only after a period of time, the length of which cannot be known ahead of time. The decision is based on information that refer to the past. Its impact will arrive in the future, when in all likelihood this information will no longer valid. Introduced to stimulate a declining Eurozone economy, QE may become an additional problem when its effects are produced. It may add fuel to the fire of inflation. In the second half of the last century, two countries adopted the same currency, Belgium and Luxembourg. The experience of that monetary union is illuminating. The two countries were very much less different from one another than those of today's Eurozone. The size of the countries, the level of income, the industrial structure of the two were definitely less diverse than those of, say, Portugal and Germany. Yet, the Belgium-Luxembourg Monetary Union was always on the verge of collapse. That experience confirms Friedman's opinion about the euro. And here I quote a Hungarian-born uh, British-educated economist who is also, in all likelihood, the greatest living political philosopher. Anthony Desjassé, and I quote, when, the Euros, when it, the Euro's adoption was decided, Milton Friedman gave it but a couple of years before it would collapse. His razor-sharp mind was convinced that a system of sovereign states with independent fiscal regimes, different legislation, and imperfectly integrated factor and product markets cannot operate a common currency without getting into an unholy mess that will bring about the breakup of the common currency area. The creators of the euro, in order to guarantee its stability, thought it necessary to accompany it with a fiscal constitution aimed at preventing excessive borrowing from national governments of member countries. From the initial ceilings on deficit and debt to GDP ratios, 3% and 60%, the countries of the eurozone have moved to a more radical arrangement the fiscal compact. It amounts to depriving national governments of sovereignty in budgetary and tax matters. Now, this is paradoxical. There is no such a thing as a European federal government. The national sovereignty has not been delegated to a superior level of government. It has just been surrendered 
to an intergovernmental agreement, and the reason is not obvious. The 50, the 50 states of the United States use the same currency, the dollar, but each one of them pursues the budgetary and tax policy it considers most appropriate. Texas, for example, does not have a state income tax. Its state finances are in order and the economy is thriving. California, on the other hand, has adopted a very expensive welfare system, runs large deficits in, uh, uh, in the state budget, and its debt is enormous. As a consequence, interest rates on California debt bonds, state bonds, are higher than those in tax of Texas. Spread is an English word. Yet, I know of no American fretting over the spread between interest rates in California and Texas and state bonds. The reason for this is that no one thinks that if the state of California is unable to borrow, Texans should be forced to buy uh, California state bonds. Nor does anybody think that the federal government should come to the rescue of California state finances or that the Fed should monetize Californian debt by printing money. In the European Union, on the other hand, the level of the spread between, say, the interest on Italian government bonds and German ones makes the headlines as if it was the most important item in the news. Yet it's written nowhere that if the Italian government cannot sell its bonds to the market, the Germans should be forced to pay for the Italian profligacy or that the ECB should monetize Italian debt. The fiscal compact is thus totally unjustified and the loss of national sovereignty senseless. What should be done when a country becomes unable to borrow? The answer is very simple, nothing. The default would damage those who had bought bonds that had become worthless paper. But no great catastrophe would hit other countries. This is what happens in the USA, where counties, cities, and states are allowed to go bankrupt. Only by accepting this inevitable solution can we be sure that member states of the Eurozone would have an incentive to manage their finances responsibly and pay the consequences of their decision. As a result of the fiscal compact, all countries in the Eurozone are attempting to balance their budgets and in most cases they are doing so by increasing taxation. They are forced to resort to ta taxes because their enormous public expenditures cannot be reduced in the short run because they are made of entitlements, mostly welfare, that require a long legislative process to be reduced. You see, a balanced budget may be desirable, a desirable state of affairs, when public spending is not too high. In my country, it was eminently desirable in 1876 when it was achieved with public spending at less than 10% of GDP. It was again a very good idea in 1947, when Luigi Einaudi and Ezio Vanoni, two scholars of public choice, one member of the Montpellier Society, a future president of the Republic of Italy, and the other a leftist Catholic, insisted that the principle of a balanced budget be included in the Italian Constitution. But public spending then was slightly more than 30% of GDP. When public spending, on the other hand, exceeds 50% of GDP, as in Italy today, it doesn't matter how it is financed, whether by taxing or by borrowing, because no matter how financed, it crowds out private spending and it makes economic growth impossible. The performance of the Italian economy confirms this pessimistic conclusion. Real income has been declining for several years. We have gone back 14 years. Unemployment has been constantly increasing and it is now close to 13%. Company, uh, companies are running out of business at an impressive rate, and youth unemployment exceeds 45%. Despite some sanguine forecasts maintaining that Italy this year should have a positive growth rate between 0 and 1%, I am skeptical. No country can grow when the average taxpayer must fork out over half of his income to the government and corporations that already pay a stunning 62.2% in tax and contribution versus a European average of 45.5% will be asked to bear much higher burdens next year. The story is not very different for most of the other countries in the Eurozone. Their performance on the average has been inferior to that of other countries in the European Union that do not use the Euro. 
The reason is simple. Almost all European countries today face a trilemma. They can have only two of these three things, high public spending, economic growth, a balanced budget. A balanced budget is certainly compatible with growth. The performance of the Italian economy in the 50s and 60s provides an excellent example. But during those years, public spending was well below 40% of GDP. A level of spending in excess of 40% of GDP is always incompatible with growth. Mark Twain was convinced that it is a difference of opinions that makes horses run. It's obvious. If everybody is convinced that the black horse is going to win, no one will bet against it. So it, there is no ground for the race. It's difference of opinion that makes markets work. If everybody wants to sell, no one can. A somewhat similar state of affairs is true for the consequences of economic policies. If in a given monetary area, some member countries pursue expansionary policies, while others recessionary ones, the consequences of the two tend to offset or mitigate each other. If instead all countries pursue the same type of policy at the same time, the impact tends to be much larger. I'm pessimistic. Not only I don't see the end of the recession, I believe that the worst is yet to come. I wouldn't be surprised if a true depression would hit the Eurozone, the rapid increase of money supply notwithstanding. Now I come to Tim Bergen's principle, probably known to most of you young economists. If Eurozone countries had kept their currency, they would have had to deal with the problem of balance of payments equilibrium with the other Eurozone countries. Also, domestic monetary stability would have been a national, not a European problem. They would have had two policy goals they now do not have. However, they would also have had two policy instruments that they do not have because of the euro, domestic monetary policy and the exchange rate. To quote Anthony Dejassé again, quote, if the region gets into balance of payments trouble, having a separate currency of its own can serve as a means of remedial adjustment either by an automatic decline in the exchange rate if it flows freely or by devaluation if it is fixed. In either case, the region pays for the luxury of having its separate currency and the means of adjusting that the currency provides by incurring the loss of potentially higher trade, a permanent opportunity cost of currency independence. It is hard to maintain that with the existence of national monies, the Eurozone would be less stable than it, is to now, than it is now. It's true that past national monetary policies have often been disastrous, creating either price inflation or recession. But as I've mentioned before, the present policy of the ECB does not, nothing to cure nostalgia for national monetary policies. All these rules and agreements have very little in common with the original European ideal. In 1954, the French parliament did not ratify the treaty creating the European Defense Community. Paradoxically, the idea had been introduced on the insistence of the French government, but after the change in parliamentary majority, the proposal was defeated. It was a blow to the hopes of those who believed in the unification of the old continent. Their generation had experienced the drama of two world wars and the decline in the relevance of Europe in the world. Before 1914, Europe was the world. After 1945, it had become the most valuable piece of real estate in the world, to use the witty expression of an American commentator. If world wars had to be avoided, and Europe given a say in world affairs, it was necessary to unite it. So after the 1954 debacle, on the initiative of the Italian foreign minister, who happened to be my father, a conference of the foreign minister or ministers of the European Coal and Steel Community was convened in Messina. On June 1st and 2nd, 1955, the six ministers of France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg met in Messina and then in the nearby town of Taormina. It was decided that times were not ripe for political unification as evidenced by the failure of the European defense community. It was better, therefore, to aim at economic integration, both because it is desirable per se 
and because it may eventually lead to political unity. The creation of a European common market would not only contribute to the prosperity of the countries involved, it would also be an effective instrument for peace in Europe. The economist, the French economist, Frédéric Bastia said, when goods do not cross borders, soldiers will. Free trade may not be a sufficient condition for peace, but it's certainly a necessary one, because protectionism and commercial warfare are usually the ones that developed into real wars. The spirit of the common market was betrayed very soon. Instead of having entirely free trade in Europe, restrictions of all kinds have been introduced. For example, Italy's production of milk has been limited with milk quotas, so that Italians would be forced to import milk produced by German and French farmers. A byproduct of these quotas is funny. <clears throat> you all know the ability of my countrymen to bypass regulation. And this confirmed by what happened in the case of quotas. Eurocrats had thought it wise to offer a compensation for every milk cow killed. The compensation was paid to farmers exhibiting the cow's ears as evidence of its death. Northern Italy was thus infested with a huge number of earless cows because, as everyone knows, ears are not used for producing milk, so you could cut the ears and still produce the milk. <laughs> you know, all the unintended consequences of European regulation should be put down in a book. It would be hilarious. However, even with these exceptions, the European common market did achieve its goal. There has been no war in Europe in the past 60 years, and commerce within has grown by leaps and bounds, contributing to the EU economic growth of these decades. It is very hard to understand what develops, developments in Europe in recent years have to do with the ideals of the founding fathers. Europe is no more politically united now than it was 60 years ago, and it's not hard to understand why. Countries were unwilling to surrender sovereignty in defense and foreign policy in the 50s, and they still are. In the millenary history of mankind, there have been states without welfare, pensions, schools, and hospitals provided by the state, but there has never been a state without defense and foreign policy. To sum up on the economic consequences of Europe, I'd say that the introduction of Europe has had some positive economic consequences because it has facilitated trade among countries in the Eurozone. Its existence, however, poses some risk because monetary instability, bad at the national level, would be disastrous at the Eurozone level. And inflation in a single European country is a phenomenon that's much less dangerous than inflation in all the 16 countries of, of the Eurozone. Also, the surrender of sovereignty in budgetary and tax matters is an unjustifiable byproduct of the euro. It has been introduced because of the insistence of the German government. Now, the German insistence is very easy to understand. Contrary to what is generally thought, many Germans do not like the single currency. And they are afraid that the economic policies of the other countries in the Eurozone will cause problems in Germany. You see, the Germans call it Teuro, uh, because it, Euro is the way Germans pronounce Euro. Teuro means increase in prices, decline in value. It's, it's a way to show their fear of this currency. They do not ma manage themselves. So the German government has, understandably, insisted on a need of the fiscal compact with the intent of convincing its citizens that there was no danger that they would have to pay for the fiscal follies of other Eurozone members. Fundamentally, however, the economic consequences of most of the Eurozone countries are not a consequence of the, of the single currency. They are domestically produced, they're not imported. The welfare state in most European countries is outrageously expensive and inefficient. Its cost puts a burden on taxpayers that makes economic growth and unemployment almost impossible. If welfare is not reformed and drastically reducing its cost, there will be no growth regardless of whether the euro is retained or abandoned. I now come to the political consequences. One of the consequences of the common currency is that it has removed constraints on the fiscal behavior of national governments. When using its own currency, 
government had an incentive to avoid devaluation or deflation because these were unpopular. unpopular. With the euro, that incentive no longer exists. Let me quote for, for the last time Tony Dejassé. No U-turn sobriety and discipline is imposed by any one member government of the 17 nation optimum currency area. The area is a characteristic public choice problem, offering to each of its members a free ride option. Each member government has a strong electoral interest to take the option ride free in the sense of letting rip both its budget and its balance of payments deficit in order to win the next election. As the effect of one country's free riding is diluted over 16 others, the offending country is not punished in the market and is under no constraint to behave responsibly. The sanctions periodically thought up and brandished by Brussels have so far simply been ignored and continue to look naive and unenforceable. Another consequence of the euro has been national political instability. In Italy, for example, in the past 20 years, the opposition party has always won national elections. So we've had the center-right winning in one election, the center-left at the following election, and so forth, always. <coughs> the same is probably true in Spain, France, and other countries. Electors blame the government for increasing taxation and slow growth. Therefore, they give opposition a chance to run the country. In, fact, in the last elections, however, most Italians had just given up. They don't vote anymore, despairing that anybody <coughs> can give them the recovery that they waited for for so many years. It is not a consequence of the euro, but many countries are trying to save welfare by cutting defense spending. In Italy, it's now less than 1% of GDP, which is about one half of the 2% NATO standard. One of the reasons why, in my opinion, Ronald Reagan has been a great president is not only that he gave birth to the most radical tax reform ever adopted in the United States and with a Democratic Congress, Democratic majority in Congress. It is the fact that he did not even consider the easy escape of cutting defense spending to offset the increases in social spending legislated by the Democratic Congress. In fact, his strategic defense initiative probably was the decisive factor that made the Soviet Union collapse. With $21 billion, he bought the collapse of the Soviet Union. The euro cannot be blamed for another feature of European governments of today, the unwillingness to fight, to defend their citizens from foreign aggressors. The generally held belief that international controversies can always be resolved through dialogue, never resorting to arms, is a delusion we should have abandoned after the experience of the 20th century as the results of the Munich conference confirms that dialogue can be effective only if the two parties are equally armed and willing to fight. It never works when one of the two is poorly armed and unwilling to fight. In democracy, demography is destiny. There are in the world today nearly one billion males aged 15 to 29. Of this billion potential fighters, 65 millions are European, 300 millions are Muslim. Most of these are in the southern shore of the Mediterranean and in the Middle East. Many of them are unemployed, hungry, and convinced by Islamist propaganda that their misery is caused by the West. With the military technology of the past, this demographic unbalance would have translated itself into the conquest of Europe by Islam. Modern military means make that outcome unlikely if not impossible. We'll have to deal with conquest to junior brothers, mass migration, and terrorism. Finally, the euro, the fiscal compact, and all the rules and regulations concocted by the EU have discredited the European ideal. Even Italians, who have traditionally been the most pro-European of all members of the EU, are becoming opposed to things European. Two Italians out of three blame the EU for economic tribulations. Pope Benedict XV maintained that the divine origin of the Catholic Church was proven by the fact that the clergy had not succeeded to destroy it. <laughs> its resistance to its abuse on the part of Europe bureaucrats has supported the goodness of the European ideal. Things, however, 
are rapidly changing, and that's hardly surprising. Jesus promised immortality to his church, but no one has done the same for European unification. Thank you so much. First of all, I would like, of course, congratulate the prof professor for this magnificent presentation. It was very concise and very witty and very substantial. Nevertheless, I would like to start with my feelings about the place and my feelings about this conference. Uh, first of all, I am very, very disappointed because I have received an invitation to Budapest Music Center and I hope that at last in my life I will access to a stage but I'm not on a stage, but in the middle of a, a library. And then uh, the introductory part uh, disclosed that it is a think tank or, or, a, or a forum for conservatives and classical liberals, and I'm considered not to belong to this uh, club, which I do not, so I feel myself uh, as if I were in alliance then, and I would be eaten up now. And if you just had this religious uh, uh, metaphors, I can say that uh, I am uh, like in the arena, a, a Christian and all the wild animals and lions are around me. Actually, it is a privilege for me uh, to speak after a professor whose father was one of the founding fathers of European integration. And actually, uh, not because I didn't want to believe it, but I checked up in Wikipedia his father's uh, actions, and uh, I found the longest article in Wikipedia, and that is the list of Italian governments after the Second World War. And uh, uh, last but not least, I would like to mention that I haven't received the presentation of the professor. So what I'm going to speak about now, or what I'm going to de deliver now, is more of, if I may use the German expression, impulse referat. So I'm just uh, reacting uh, to what I have heard uh, just, uh, just now. Uh, the professor mentioned that uh, the Belgium and Luxembourg monetary union was always on the verge of collapse, and I think it, it, it can be true. But uh, I think that it proved to be, uh, how could I say, viable and sustainable, since uh, it, uh, dangers are always there in, in many economic policy matters, in most of the economic policy matters. So I, I'm not afraid of the creation of the euro and the activity of, uh, of all the member states and all the central banks and the whole system, the whole uh, euro uh, system. Actually, I think the professor hasn't mentioned uh, the euro crisis as... Uh, an important phenomenon of these days, but it is widely discussed in the economic press that there is a euro crisis, but actually it is not the case. I would like to underline that there was no substitution of the euro, even in the first years when Greece was for the first time on the verge of, of uh, exiting the eurozone and the, the Grexit, I think it was a 2011, 10 and 11, uh, and uh, there was no major depreciation of the euro, so there is trust in the euro. Uh, now we know that the dollar appreciated against the euro and then the uh, pound sterling appreciated a lot and the Swiss franc in, in recent months or, or yeah, recent months. Uh, nevertheless, we cannot say that people would try to get rid of the euro. So uh, I think that there is a, a general belief, a general trust in the euro. So it is widely accepted and, and uh, widely uh, stockpiled. And um, my approach would be a, a bit different than that of the professor. Because I think that uh, if we uh, look around and try to identify economic problems, we can find economic problems and social problems and political problems in all countries. If you look to the United States and uh, you know that uh, the mean income hasn't increased for 25 years or 35 years, uh, so there is an economic development we all know, but the, the distribution of wealth is, uh, is uh, uh, not equitable. Or if you look at Japan, you see Japan is not a member of a currency union, it has got its own currency and we know what is happening, or ha what has been happening for now 25 years in Japan. So uh, uh, there are economic problems in all countries and I think that uh, we have to identify the causes and roots of these economic problems and I think now in the Eurozone one of the ob obvious uh, uh, cause what we at the first sight may identify can be the, uh, the existence of the euro and some problems are uh, undoubtedly created by the, uh, by the euro, all these imbalances in the favor of Germany and it is natural that the Germans like the euro and some Hungarian economists, but not only Hungarian economists but uh, foreign ones uh, as well, stated that the problem within the eurozone is not Greece, the problem is Germany. 
So it, it is not Greece that has to change, of course, there are uh, very profligate practices in, in Greece, uh, but in, in Germany, this, uh, this kind of fiscal discipline can be a cause of the, of the uh, failures or uh, the deficiencies or the weaknesses of uh, the Eurozone. I would like to say some words about the Hungarian stance towards the Euro, because we are now in Hungary and perhaps it is uh, of interest, can be of interest to you. And I have here a copy of this uh, economic journal of the Hungarian Academy of uh, Sciences. I hope that the majority of the audience is Hungarian and can understand uh, the Hungarian name for that. And we had a special issue in June 2012. There was a major study on rethinking, re-evaluating re uh, Hungary's accession to the Eurozone. Uh, two scholars wrote uh, a quite lengthy study, and then I invited uh, 12 economists, among others, Professor uh, Peter Akos Bot, who made a, a valuable contribution him himself. And uh, then, uh, based on the lessons of, of uh, this major study and all the contributions by outstanding economists, I would like to say that uh, everybody uh, were ex uh, was expecting a kind of convergence within the Eurozone, which was not the case, as the professor stated. So it, it did not solve the, the problem of, uh, of uh, the discrepancies of the level of development of the, uh, of the countries of the Eurozone. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in this part of Europe, it is not convergence. We have got a, a different aspect. We speak all the time about catching up. And the majority of Hungarian economists stated that Euro would not be a good tool for catching up within uh, the European uh, Union. Nevertheless, it would be of outstanding importance to join this Eurozone, the sooner the better. In Hungary, and now I turn to the foreign, to the foreign guests, I mean those uh, who are not Hungarians, the Hungarian government has not a date, hasn't got a date fixed for uh, exceeding to the Eurozone, so we, we don't have a target. And many economists claim that it would be nice because it would, uh, would uh, serve as an anchor of expectations and it would then uh, lend credibility to the economic policy of the Hungarian government. Nevertheless, the majority opinion is that we should attain a high level of credibility without introducing the euro or before introducing the euro uh, because uh, this kind of credibility cannot be imported. Our government has to solve the problems, as the professor, in my eyes, very rightly said, that all the problems must be solved by the national governments. We cannot just expect, uh, it was mentioned in the very kind introduction that I was responsible uh, in the National Development Office uh, uh, for the channeling of European funds, European support to Hungary. Actually, the whole office was responsible and I was one of the uh, vice presidents. Uh, so uh, we could not expect and should not expect even now that the Hungarian economic problems could be solved by the support coming from the European Union. But at a very low voice, I would like to tell you that in the preceding period, 95-97% of all public investments in Hungary were financed or co-financed by European Union support. So it is of outstanding importance for a country like Hungary and for all these East and Central European countries to do everything what we can to be good uh, uh, member states, disciplined man member states in uh, the European uh, Union. My, in my eyes, the, the right question is, is Europe better off with the euro than it would be without the euro? So this is, I think, an economically well-founded question. And not what are the deficiencies of the euro? Of course, it, it, uh, it deserves attention from the economic profession to make research in that direction. What are the deficiencies and failures of the euro? So the whole construction uh, is, is not so strong as it seemed to be. And just for a moment, I would like to come back to uh, this issue. When we uh, presented this is issue to the public, then we organized a conference, and the former president of the Central Bank, not uh, Professor uh, Peter Bott, who was a former governor of the Central Bank himself, but another one, said, and he was alone with his statement, but he is, how could I say, a very prestigious Hungarian economist, who said that since this euro construction, the whole setup of, of, of the euro uh, system, I'm sorry, and, and the currency, is, is not so well conceived that Hungary should not uh, hurry up too, too quickly to, to join uh, the eurozone. 
Uh, and uh, just coming back to the presentation by the professor, I would like to mention that I totally un understand that he spoke about the importance of defense spending. What else can one expect from a former minister of defense? So it is quite natural. And I know that Hungary is lagging behind concerning this NATO obligation. We are around uh, one point something or uh, closer to, to one, although we, we uh, repeatedly pledged that we would in in increase it. And, uh, and, 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 yeah. yes, and, and when we criticize the Euro and the European Union, I totally subscribe to what the professor said, that uh, it is profligate, that it is misusing the funds, it abusing sometimes the possibilities of, of all these tricks and all the regulations and, and all these technicalities, and so on and so forth. But I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, are we always satisfied with the government of our respective countries? So it is the, the bureaucrats in the, in the Euro who misbehave in Brussels, but sometimes in the national governments and the public administrations in the respective countries uh, 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 abuse the power and, uh, and, uh, and, and then ca they can be blamed as well. And uh, last but not least, I would like just to, to finish uh, my short intervention uh, by citing a couple of days ago I... Uh, read about good government and good governance. And good government, uh, I can't remember uh, who said this, uh, is when politicians are lying in the sake of the general public. And bad governance is when politicians are lying in their own sake. So I think uh, this lying uh, it can be present on European level as well. And, uh, and national level as well. And we have to, to be aware of this uh, possibility or, or, or this general rule. I do not know whether it is a general rule or not. And uh, we should uh, follow very closely the actions and we have to distinguish between the, the slogans and the actions. And we have to be in mind that there is a possibility that uh, they diverge. But I think we have to be realistic and have to, uh, have to see that uh, the politicians cannot always do what they would like the best and, and uh, uh, that the realities can constrain the politicians as well. And from this aspect, I think the euro was a good solution with all its uh, deficiencies and failures. And I hope that some of you share my view in this respect. Thank you very much.